And welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bob Orr. Well, the confirmation hearings for Elena Kagan have now drawn to a close, and her confirmation by the Senate seems all but assured. One Republican Senator, Orrin Hatch, says he will vote no, and Jeff Sessions, ranking Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee, is still on the fence. But Sessions didn't mince words when he came when it came to how he felt about Kagan's performance this week. Our chief legal correspondent, Jan Crawford, caught up with Senator Jeff Sessions. Thanks, Bob. It's been four days of hearings here at the Senate for Solicitor General Elena Kagan to see if she's going to get confirmed to the Supreme Court. Two days where she was subjected to really tough questions from Republicans that focused on a host of issues, notably her efforts to limit military recruiting when she was dean at Harvard Law School, her opposition to some of the Supreme Court's ruling, her uh, positions on some key social issues like abortion and gun rights. Uh, we're going to talk about that right now with Senator Jeff Sessions. He, of course, is the ranking Republican. He he pressed uh, Elena Kagan really hard on a lot of these issues. And I'm going to turn to you, Senator, and just ask you, first of all, what did we learn in these uh, two days of tough questions that you had for her? What did you learn about Elena Kagan that you didn't know going in? Well, I, I was disappointed. I just have to be honest. And, and I'm looking at the transcript and make sure I'm treating her fairly. But I felt she was less than open with us, certainly and even less than candid her perspective on how she explained the entire effort at, at Harvard to block the military from using the recruiting offices, I thought completely uh, missed uh, the reality of what occurred. She led the fight without legal authority to reverse the policy and block them from this kind of access that the law required them to have. Full, equal access, not access to the campus, but access to the recruiting office and the facilities. And now you made the point during these hearings that this came about, obviously, during a time of war. Uh, this was more than just, you know, making it a little harder for the military. She said, of course, she reveres the military. But that's pretty strong words that you think that she was not uh, really forthcoming, intellectually dishonest in that testimony. I mean, do you think she was just kind of spinning the committee? Well, I got to tell you, the, it was so consistent with the White House spin and I really became irritated with it. It made me angry that they were spinning this thing in a way that was I didn't think was accurate, and I was really shocked. I thought she would just admit a lot of these things right off the bat, and she did not. So that did worry me about the rigor of her analysis, her self-honesty, and her ability to make uh, to understand really the, the, her requirement to be absolutely truthful in a complete way with us. Now, you know, of course, Elena Kagan so famously in 1995, and we heard a lot about that this week when she was in um, a teacher at the University of Chicago, a professor there in 1995. She wrote a law review article calling the Senate Judiciary confirmation process a charade and a farce. Did she, and of course the reason for that was because she said the nominees don't ever say anything. Did she say anything, or was this just more of the same? She didn't say much. Uh, I thought... She obfuscated her philosophy. Her, her testimony, I believe, consistent with her record, indicates to me what she will be with the leftist activist members of the Supreme Court, pretty clearly. But she acknowledged nothing like that. Uh, she, you know, suggested that she gave no suggestion about what kind of judge I think she would be in a real sense. And I think she failed her own test. Of course, most of them have. But I really think John Roberts and Sam Alito actually were pretty open about what they believed, how they interpreted law, what kind of judge they were going to be. I thought she was less so. So she, you think she failed her own test, but what's that going to mean? I mean, you know, Senator Specter, I thought, was really interesting on some of these points this week. Senator Specter was saying, basically, what are we supposed to do? You're not answering substantive questions. Does that mean we vote no? Are you going to vote no? Well, you know, that is one way to sort of complain against the nominee, and maybe we need to start saying we can't support you if you come in with a White House kind of spin. We've got to know who you are. Defend your views. If you have views about the court, if you have views about the role of a judge, articulate them, defend them, and we can respect them. We may accept them. We may That might make us vote against you. We might vote for you out of respect for the way you argued your case. And I think that would be a higher standard, the kind she asked for in her law review. All right, but Senator, 
Now, let's not dodge the question. Yeah, yeah the hearings are concluded. What, what are you going to vote? What do you think you're going to vote no on this one? Obviously, you did on Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, what, what's your position going to be on Kagan? I am going to uh, continue to review the record. Uh, you asked me honestly, my comfort level with this nomination is less today than before the hearing started. Less today. Less today. I thought she, you know, was smooth and she was articulate, but is actually giving you know, putting some meat on, you know, on the bones here of who she is uh, and her accuracy in several different aspects of uh, testimony worried me. So we'll give her a fair shake, but uh, uh, I haven't been uh, won over just by this testimony. All right, but will she be confirmed? Well, I mean, you've got the majority Democrats in the Senate. Uh, they tend to want to support the president, uh, but we'll see how all this plays out. And I, don't, I think it's premature to start saying that. All right. Well, Senator Sessions, thank you very much. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And, Bob, we'll see what happens. Uh, the committee, of course, will come back the week after their 4th of July uh, recess and talk about this, and then we'll expect a vote probably the third week of July, and then it'll go on to the full Senate floor to, to see whether Elena Kagan will be confirmed as the 112th Justice of the United States. Bob. All right, thanks, Jan Crawford with Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions. Well, from Elena Kagan, now we turn to this week's flashpoints with our national security analyst, Juan Zarate. And Juan, let's start with something that was kind of interesting this week. Al Qaeda now has a magazine. Yeah, uh, a magazine called Inspire. Uh, it's not new, Bob, that Al Qaeda is trying to reach Western audiences. They've done it through folks like Adam Gadan, the uh, Southern California member of Al-Qaeda, Omar Hamami, who's a member of the Al-Shabaab movement in Somalia, connected to Al-Qaeda, and even with Anwar al awlaki the Yemeni American cleric, who's had sermons online for some time. Uh, the reality is this isn't new, and the use of the Internet is not new. What's different, though, Bob, and I think what's concerning to officials who think this is real, this is from Al-Qaeda, I think that's uh, not much in dispute at this point, is uh, that they see this as an extension of what Anwar al awlaki has been trying to do, to raise the, his own profile as well as the profile of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula to lure Westerners, to be the siren song for people to join the cause, either to come fight abroad or to fight within their countries. And you've seen this with Alaki's statements. The other thing that's very interesting to me is that uh, this moves the center of gravity of the media uh, uh, sort of arm of Al Qaeda to Yemen. Uh, where, where Al Qaeda had relied on the Asahab media arm out of Pakistan to really be the center of gravity for its media operations, this moves it to Yemen and starts to put greater premium on what Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is doing, not just to foment attacks, but to foment the ideological divide in the, in the rest of the world. There's an English language uh, uh, copy of this or edition of this, so clearly they're targeting Westerners. They want this to be read and shared and spread among Westerners. No, that's absolutely right. That's their target audience. And I think what they're doing is they're reacting to the environment. They're seeing that there is growing, uh, a growing allure to this narrative in places like the United States. They see that uh, young people can be drawn to it via videos, via online messaging. And so in some ways they're casting their net widely. And if they get just a few more adherents as a result of this new journal, they see that as a success. My advice to the U.S. government, to anybody else who wants to oppose this, is we need to mock this. Uh, we need to have the onion version uh, that makes fun of this in a way that decreases the sense of heroism and uh, excitement that they're trying to foment with a journal like it. All right, the big story of the week uh, here and around the world, really, has been this alleged Russian spy ring. Ten people arrested in the U.S., an 11th person who's now on the lam, apparently last seen in Cyprus. Is this a big deal? I mean, it's been tabloid fodder. A lot of people have talked about it. What do you make of this? Well, it's certainly interesting. And, Bob, you've done some great reporting on this. Uh, but I think it's a reminder that uh, countries are driven by interests, not necessarily by goodwill or other uh, other measures. And I think also uh, the fact that within Russia there is still a Cold War mindset, at least in some elements of their government, certainly their intelligence services, uh, that leads them to view the U.S. as a target versus uh, a partner. And, you know, this comes at an interesting time when the U.S. and Russian relationship is part of this reset that President Obama has wanted to, uh, to inject. And it comes right on the heels of the Cheeseburger Summit. The Great Hamburger Summit, yeah. yeah. the Hamburger Summit. And so the timing of this uh, could not have been worse for the White House or for Medvedev, for that matter, uh, with respect to the revelation of this, of this network. That said, no one should be surprised the Russians are spying here in the U.S. And no one should be surprised that they have different elements of an intelligence-gathering apparatus. Some 
elements are uh, attempting to get classified information to get moles on the inside of places like CIA or the Department of Defense. Other elements are softer networks, like the one that was revealed here. What's, I think, a little bit disconcerting and confusing to Americans is why you would need a group of people like this in an open society in the Internet age where you can <laughs> get a lot of this information online. Sure. But I think the great value, and you've pointed this out, Bob, is they were acting as spotters. That's mm. valuable. Potential be, recruiters. Potential recruits, uh, spotting people who are potentially vulnerable to recruitment, people who are on their way up, ex-officials, current officials, future officials. Uh, and I think that's a valuable uh, tool in, in any intelligence gathering arsenal. So we shouldn't just laugh that one off. I don't think so. I think what's interesting about this is what's not in the complaint. Mm -hmm. you know, what haven't we? What what haven't we learned about what they've learned? Who were they cozying up to? Uh, and also the timing of this is all very interesting. CIA Director Leon Panetta recently gave a very forthcoming interview about a number of topics. He talked about terror and Al Qaeda and Iran and the CIA itself. I mean, what struck you about this? Well, I think this was an extraordinary interview, and I think uh, some of what he revealed is, is things that we know generally, but to have it come from the CIA director is incredibly important. Let, let me give you some examples very quickly here. With respect to Afghanistan, he signaled very clearly that he does not see reconciliation sort of on the horizon. He doesn't see any evidence of uh, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, the Haqqani Network, any, anybody that needs to be at the table for reconciliation actually doing that. And he said that the U.S., uh, the, the proposition is that the U.S. has to demonstrate strength in order for these uh, individuals to come to the table, and it hasn't happened yet. That's a revelation. Uh, he, he dropped down the estimate of the number of Al-Qaeda members that we think are in Afghanistan. He said 60 to 100 or less. Uh, and so that adds to the debate about whether or not this is really about dismantling Al-Qaeda or preserving uh, Afghanistan so it's not a safe haven long term, which is a very different proposition, I would say. Uh, and he also then revealed uh, that we were the ones who took out Sheikh Saeed al-Masri, the number three al-Qaeda member, which we all suspected. But they've always denied that. I mean, but they've denied they've it. They've had he, public denial. Right, but he, uh, he admitted this. And so I think it was a very interesting revelation. He's very open uh, and to his credit. Uh, with respect to Iran, very important revelations. Uh, yeah, he says that uh, the U.S. government, he thinks that Iran is uh, continuing to march toward a weapons capability, which completely contradicts the 2007 uh, national intelligence en estimate from the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. uh, we're expecting a new one, so we can already forecast what it's going to look like, uh, Leon Panetta has told us. He said that uh, he thinks Iran has enough uranium uh, for two bombs uh, that can be weaponized within a year and delivered with yet another year of, uh, of potential technological development. So that puts a two-year window. The first time we've heard a U.S. official give a very hard date for when we think there may be an outer chance for Iran to be able to deploy a nuclear weapon. Uh, and he also admitted that he didn't think sanctions would change the regime's calculus, which is exactly the opposite of what we've heard from, for example, Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton. Finally, he also said that the Israelis are of a different mind than we are. They already think that the Iranians have made the decision to go and develop a nuclear weapon, which creates some tension with respect to how to deal with Iran. So all of that with respect to Iran was extremely important and reveals quite a bit about what the U.S. government is Very thinking. open stuff from America's top spy. I mean, it's not something we usually hear from the CIA. Yeah, and I think this comes from Leon Panetta's background. Uh, he's a politician by trade. He, he knows how to mix it up in Washington circles. He's not an intelligence professional by training. And so, um, you know, this is Leon Panetta being Leon, Leon Panetta yeah. and revealing much. One other thing I think he revealed that people didn't quite catch uh, he's t he talked about the, CIA, the investigation of the CIA officers who were involved in interrogation, investigation Eric Holder reopened. Um, he seemed to suggest in his conversations with Eric Holder that he, he said, I think uh, things will turn out okay, which to me is a bit of a, a, a signal. If you read the tea leaves, it sounds like uh, the, in the conversations it may suggest that the investigation is not going to go forward at the end of the day. We'll see, but I think he revealed quite a bit in this yeah, And that's an announcement we would have expected to come from the Justice Department right. at some point, and maybe it will. All right, U.S.-Saudi relations. This really was kind of buried by the other news of the week. Yeah. But King Abdullah was here, met in the Oval Office with the President. Why is this a critical time in U.S.-Saudi relations? Well, this was an important meeting, in part to resolve what was viewed as a very rocky meeting in Riyadh uh, when President Obama visited King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia uh, about a year ago. And so this was an attempt to kind of reframe, refresh that relationship, give it a sense of weight. 
Uh, but the relationship with Saudi Arabia is very important, and it's not just about the oil. People need to remember that. Uh, Saudi Arabia is very much worried about Iran, a Shia competitor in the region. Uh, Saudi Arabia is now starting to think about whether or not they need to develop their own nuclear program as a result of what's happening with Iran. They're not sure if the U.S. has the staying power, the willingness to really prevent Iran uh, from acquiring a nuclear weapon. Uh, you have the Palestinian issue. Uh, King Abdullah has been quite impatient with the level of pace, our inability to move the Israelis to the negotiating table. Uh, and he's also been concerned about Guantanamo. He wants to see that closed, uh, but he also doesn't want to see the Yemeni detainees, who are the vast majority of Romani detainees, mm -hmm. find their way into Saudi Arabia. Uh, and so there's a whole host of issues that are critical to geopolitics that Saudi Arabia is right in the middle of, and this relationship is very important in that regard. And the whole Yemeni thing also plays into the, the growing strength of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. That's exactly which right. Which is all part of the same problem. That's exactly It's all interconnected. Now, we, we've seen the World Cup play out. Big news today, uh, the Netherlands beat Brazil, which is yeah. a crisis in Brazil. And the U.S. went down to Ghana, but in this you find some good news, too. Yeah, no, I hate to see the U.S. lose, and uh, it's quite unfortunate. Actually, I think it's unfortunate because it's deflated some attention, I think, in the U.S. to the World Cup. But, um, you know, if you're going to lose to a country, it's not bad to lose to Ghana. It's the, the sole remaining African country in the World Cup. The entire continent is rallying behind Ghana, known as the Black Stars because of right. the, the flag. Uh, and it's appropriate in some ways that Ghana be in this position, uh, not because of what they do on the field, but what they've done in their country. Uh, Ghana was visited by President Bush, recently pr visited by President Obama, hailed and generally praised as an ideal African country, relatively stable uh, democracy, uh, an economy that's growing uh, with some degree of confidence, a growing middle class, uh, peacekeeping forces at helping all throughout Africa. So in some ways it has been viewed as one of the model countries in Africa. And so it's not only a great representative on the pitch uh, f in the World Cup for Africa, but perhaps off the field as well. So it's tough to lose, but if we had to lose, pretty good opponent. Yeah, and they were a good team. They beat us uh, fairly and squarely. <laughs> Well, Juan, we covered the globe today. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, as always. And finally, today, it was the first national memorial dedicated to our women in uniform. But today, a lack of funds means hard times for the women in military service for America Memorial, which is to close. Our man Fernando Suarez reports. One, two, three, four. Thirteen years ago, 40,000 people attended the opening of the first national women's war memorial. Today, the crowds are gone, and the memorial is struggling to keep its doors open. There were four of us together, we roomed together, and there are only two of us left. Lorraine Dieterle is one of the few who remain. 20 years ago, she helped raise more than $50,000 to build the memorial. Several of us women got together. We thought we'd have bake sales, garage sales. If anybody bought it, we sold it <laughs> to raise funds for our memorial. Dieterle was a combat photographer for the Coast Guard during World War II, a time when there were very few women in the military, let alone on the front lines. And this tells what, what was important to me when I was in the military. She's worked for the foundation for two decades, and in all that time, she hasn't forgotten the struggles that she and her sister soldiers faced for so many years. When they come here and they see this memorial, they all do the same thing that I do every day when I work here. The tears flow copiously, you know. Dieter Lee is 84 now and says it's time to pass the torch on to a younger generation of women who serve the military. People don't understand, they don't know how much our women have served our country. They've lived, they've died way back from World War I, World War II, and today even more. The foundation's president, retired Brigadier General Wilma Vaught, says she hopes the women in today's armed forces will someday recognize the importance of the memorial. I think you have to reach a certain point in age before you fully appreciate what your military service has meant to you. And all of a sudden, you think, gee, I want to preserve that memory. The problem is preserving that memory costs a lot of money, about $3 million a year. Last year, finances got so tight, the federal government had to intervene with a grant to help keep the memorial afloat. Bob? Fernando Suarez, thanks very much. And thanks to all of you for watching Washington Unplugged today. Join us here every day on CBSNews.com. I'm Bob Orr. Have a great fourth holiday.